Hello and welcome to the 21st Century Work Life podcast, where we talk about leading remote teams, online collaboration and working in distributed organizations. This podcast is brought to you by Virtual Not Distant, where we help managers and teams transition to an office optional approach. Find out everything we do over at virtualnotdistant.com and check out our show notes and pictures of our lovely guests over on the podcast page. It's great to have you here, listeners. Let's get on with the show. Hello and welcome to episode 227 of the 21st Century Work Life podcast, where today we're covering what's going on, techno stress and visible teamwork. If we haven't met before, my name is Pilar Orti. Excellent. Glad you're dropping by. And I am the director of Virtual Not Distant. If you're a regular listener, welcome back. You might have noticed that we've made a small change in our planned schedule. We were due to broadcast episode four of our Connection and Disconnection in Remote Team series. But instead, we're bringing you an episode with Maya and myself which we actually recorded it about two weeks ago and it's, it was just now in danger of becoming out of date. So we will continue with our Connection series next week. And if you haven't listened to those episodes, well, do give them a listen because in the current situation, I am recording on the 19th of March, 2020, we cannot stop thinking about our mental health and that of our team members. So Check them out, um, especially episodes uh, two and three. They're, they're, they're short, punchy, and you will get a lot out of them. And uh, speaking of which, the current situation, if you've had enough of content around COVID-19, you might want to skip the first 12 minutes of this episode where we actually look at the current situation and just what it might mean. <laughs> so if you had enough, skip that, because other than that, for most of the episode, you will be in quite a corona-free zone. So we will do our usual roundup of news and articles. Again, they're a couple of weeks out of date. We incorporate some listener feedback. So thank you to everyone who ever talks about our show or our blogs uh, or our blog posts. Um, and also for those of you who are looking at how to work differently in the new context and how to create different collaboration practices while while you've, you're away from each other, then uh, we cover the principles of visible teamwork. And the nice thing about principles is that they should work regardless of your context. You will apply them differently in different contexts, but by bringing these to you, we hope that they will help you now and also in the future, however you end up working once um, the emergency is over. So before I go into lockdown, which is due to happen tomorrow in London, let's have a listen to see what's going on. At the moment, as we speak, it's just increasing. It's probably going to be on the rise. Uh, mm. uh, stuff is happening. But we wanted to look at it from a few different points of view. And uh, I suppose, um, first of all, Maya, what do you want to say about some of the stuff you're coming across, how the, how the remote community is responding to this? Well, I think the remote community, obviously there's a degree of opportunism that you can't help but notice, but by and large, it's really positive, actually. We're seeing lots of people coming together to contribute resources, knowledge, sharing, huge volumes of content to help people because I think there's a danger always with the remote community that we can be quite self-referential. We know what we love and we advocate for the way we like to work, but largely we're kind of preaching to the choir within our own community. And now suddenly there's this massive global experiment going on. There's all these hundreds of thousands of people all over the world suddenly having this thrust upon them. And we have to change the way we communicate and the way we explain. And I think some places are doing that very well. And I hope that we can make ourselves part of that conversation, but also by keeping an eye on the future and what people need from us in the long term. Mm. So um, I wanted to refer then to an article that Maya wrote, <laughs> but I chose it. And it's called, Everybody Stay Away From The Office! Exclamation mark is not a remote work strategy. And it was published in Medium uh, on the 3rd of 
March. And what is this article about, Maya? Well, this was, yeah, I mean, I do have a lot of concerns about the idea that people are having to work from home rather than choosing to work from home. And I did want to reflect that concern. We've always talked at Virtual Not Distant about remote work done well, not remote work done um, ad hoc or for the sake of it, and ideally not done under these conditions where people are literally being forced into these big organization-wide decisions, everybody grab a laptop, laptop and go away. And, you know, that's really not the way we've ever said you should be doing it. So hopefully people are going to muddle through, they're going to manage, they're going to put things in place as quickly as possible. But I did want to reflect the fact that people are starting from such radically different places and different organizations. For some, it's going to be quite easy because they're already really driven by cloud service provision. They've got everything in place. They really can even if they're not used to it culturally, at least they're technically ready to work from home. In other organizations, I mean, I've heard from people on Twitter and LinkedIn who, nobody's even got laptops. They used to be machines on their desk in the office and nobody has a, you know, they've got the first thing they've got to do is order 200 laptops so that people can work from home. So, or they've everything's on a big on-premises server and nobody knows how they're going to provision it for people to work away from home. So, I was concerned. I mean, this article was written off the back of an event that I went to about Microsoft Teams, which is obviously one of those software suites that's very well placed. If people are using Microsoft Teams, then they're fairly close to ready, whether they know it or not. Um, And there are obviously probably a lot of people now trying to make that transition from more traditional software platforms. But depending on where they're starting from, that's either going to be a short hop or a vast chasm to jump. That has been my uh, concern all along as well, is that, uh, and actually you said something interesting to me off mic the other day, <laughs> where you said, you know, there probably will be quite a lot of people who who have been trying to find the opportunity to have a more flexible approach to work, including working from home. And this might be an opportunity actually to show that it can be done and that there is a need for it to be ready also for it. Um, whereas m- m- my concern uh, m- mirrors more what you were saying just now about I'm just really concerned that everyone's going to going to be made to work from home. Mm. And uh, we already released a short episode a couple of um, weeks ago talking to uh, Jackie Walpole about this. And uh, this thing that not everyone wants to work from home. And that is why uh, we talk about online collaboration. We do talk about remote work, but we also talk about office optional because we do realize that a lot of people prefer to work in the office and uh, remote work can also be done from an office. <laughs> whether it's your headquarters or not, because this is an additional problem is that usually uh, independent workers can choose where to work from. But now, very soon, I I mean, I'm sure at some point co-working spaces maybe will also close. I don't know. Or maybe people can't go to co-working spaces because they have to look after their children because the schools have been closed down. Yeah. We've got two experiments going on here, really. There's the work mm. one, but there's also a huge social change being enforced on people. I mean, I think in Italy now, even things like restaurants and coffee shops have closed, for example. So that route that people might have, well, I'm home-based, but I'm actually feeling really isolated and I just want to be around other people, even at a safe social distance, that's now being taken away from people. So a lot of people are going to experience homeworking for the first time in conjunction with this tremendous social isolation, which really isn't the norm for homeworking or remote working in any sense. So I'm going to refer um, to uh, an article. It's in Spanish, listeners, but you can probably just Google Translate if you're interested. It's been written by Eva Rimbaugilavert, who's been on the show a couple of times. And um, <laughs> the headline is, Coronavirus, telework was not this. <laughs> That's a really poor translation of the title. But, and it's all about, and it's this thing that Spain is not ready for people to be working away from base because it, they've been pushing it away. And anyone interested, we have a whole episode which covers this. Yes, <laughs> I mean, that was very much the point that Eva made in that episode, wasn't it? That Spain is quite a way behind the curve of picking up um, on the, the changes needed for homeworking. And so, yeah, really not well placed for this this transition, sadly. Yeah. And that's episode 214. Uh, and Eva shares the concerns we're talking about, that, uh, that it's going to be done in a rush, without resources, badly, and... I don't know, my concern that in the future people will go, oh, we tried that. Do you remember working from home from the coronavirus? Oh, yeah, that, that was remote awful. Effect is yeah. not going to work. Yeah. yeah. So 
Anyway, so um, <laughs> so we shall we shall move on. We really don't know what's going to happen. Uh, well, for a start, my uh, trip to Spain has been cancelled because Madrid is not doing very well. Uh, uh, Fias were cancelled in Valencia, weren't they, Maya? <laughs> yes, the biggest fiesta of the year is supposed to be taking place next week. Yeah. Seven hundred yeah. million in in tourist revenues just wiped out overnight, and it's the same in Denia. It's the biggest fiesta of the year, so it's it, lots of effects everywhere yeah. locally. So this, as you say, this is not an, just an experiment in remote work. Maya, you 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 hit the nail on the head. Uh, it mm. it is a huge thing going on, and uh, we and as always, context is really important. So if the if an organization or a team is trying this out for the first time, just remember your context and what that context is doing for you. Can I say one last thing um, on this? Is uh, Tina Meckel in Virtual Team Talk, which is one of the communities that we featured in episode. So 222 on online communities, uh, we featured virtual team talk. And t um, I, uh, Tina Meckel, in reply to another, to someone else's post around all of this, she said, um, I'm going to quote her and I have her permission. Uh, we were talking about th this thing that, okay, lots of people now are asking for help to go remote um, and sorry, to work from home. And uh, she said, I've been working with teams and participants in the past where international staff have been evacuated from fragile security contexts and the local stay. I learned at my first workshop, to my naive surprise, that we had to first work through their feelings towards their situation and their affirmations and mindset towards virtual collaboration before we could get into the how-to. I think this is something that organizations are not doing. If 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 I'm to believe what it, I haven't really sat with anyone who's going through this. Only Jackie, and actually she was very mindful. Um, but it, this is really a thing. It's not about oh, how do we do this. Like no, hang on. First we have to settle into it. Yeah, and except and that it's different for different locations, different areas, different countries are at different places with this. And mm. just getting used to it. It's like again at the time of recording, we've just had. Um, the blocking of flights to the US from Europe. And I think that's made a lot of people in Europe go, oh, what? <laughs> you know? yeah. um, but that obviously means that people in the US are perceiving what's going on in Europe as somewhere very different and dangerous. Um, and so that they might relate differently to colleagues and co-workers who they collaborate with internationally, but are seen as going through a very different experience. And it's the same with collaborating with people in Asia who are again at a different point on this curve of whatever is going on out there. So we have to acknowledge that the cultural differences are probably magnified now because of that cultural thing is so linked to what's going on geographically and medically. So within all this, it leaves uh, us who are um, in the business of helping people move their collaboration online, thinking, what do we do? Do we offer lots of help more? <laughs> how do we do? Do, do we suddenly, um, so do we offer to um, teach people how to work from home, which we haven't done because our job is to help managers transition their teams or to train managers to lead their remote teams or to facilitate team conversations. Um, and I think uh, there's a danger just uh, of, of seeing this as a business opportunity or maybe maybe it can be a distraction. So I think we're, we're as always trying to Look at it uh, in in the long term. Yes, I think is, yeah. Um, yeah. and support those managers who are supporting those people. Um, yeah, you know because yes, there's an awful lot of lists of tips for how to work from home and what you should wear and things like that. That's never been our territory, and we want to support the people who are having to manage teams and also manage business productivity and continuity through this unprecedented situation. Yeah, because and to be completely honest, listeners, also, this is not something that was in the budget. <laughs> this is not something that learning and development was budgeting for. So I think we also have to be mindful of that, is that, um, yeah, this is this is suddenly sudden, sudden training or sudden development. So what we're hoping is that at some point, and it could be months, it really could be months, we don't know, that at some point people will have to... Uh, uh, fire, fire fight it, fire fought it. <laughs> Put <laughs> the fire the, out. <laughs> yeah, we'll have done the firefighting throughout this period. And some people will come out the other way and going, you know what? I think we need to learn how to do this for whatever reason. It could be because people have actually thought in, in a better context, this could be interesting or because we don't want to be in this situation again. 
whatever. Or because the CEO has been home and has really liked it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, because it might happen. Absolutely. Um, and there will be people who love it. You know, however chaotic the implementation is, I think there will definitely be a cohort of people who experience this for the first time and really see the potential, if not the actuality of how good it could be. So we will be here when everyone comes out the other <laughs> yep. end and decides that an office optional approach uh, is best. Once this huge experiment has happened, don't let things just go back to normal. Even if there's a decision that we're not going to change how we work in normal circumstances, this is an opportunity to stop and think together and talk. Mm. <laughs> this is really, this is, this is that one of those times when, when things can go back to how they were, that we actually look at what we learned, even if it was horrible and terrible, Look at what we learned and what can that teach us about yeah. modifying how we were working before. So I think that's a really good point. Good. So <laughs> talking of offices, um, right, so we'll move on. I listened to, oh, I don't know what the episode number was, but anyway, um, I'll tell you in a second. So Rework, episode 68. Um, it's called, this was a really interesting episode by Basecamp. So I recommend Rework. Sometimes they talk about remote work. Sometimes they don't. It's, it, but I like the guys. Um, well, the, the people, because it's not just men. So, And this episode is called You Never Forget George Papa George. I missed that one. <laughs> so what's that all about? <laughs> well, I will tell you who he is in a second. But basically... Basecamp, many of our listeners will have heard of them. They will have read their book Remote. They will have read the book Rework. And it doesn't have, my favorite one is it doesn't have to be crazy at work. They basically, they're a company that said, we don't want to be huge. So they're about 50 something people. They're the ones that said, oh, you don't really need an office. And so they have, they still have a, a hub. Um, and they really just challenge a lot of the, the common work practices, work business practices. And this episode is about uh, Jason Fried saying, talking to the podcaster saying, I don't know, should, should we renew the lease of our office because it's coming to, uh, to an end? Uh, they actually were going to raise the price. Uh, it's in Chicago. And it's this whole conversation about, okay, well, what, what do we need an office? And if we want one, what's it going to be for? Which I thought was the most interesting part. They were saying, well, maybe we don't need to rush and get premises. We can think about it. So maybe for a year we are office-less. Um, so, and for me, it was just really interesting from the people who are saying, yes, of course, you can be distributed. You don't need an office. Actually really thinking through whether they need it or not. I love it. Yeah, I want yeah. to listen to that one. I mean, it's exactly yeah. the point we just made about when there's a transition, if you use it as a time to pause and reflect and respond rather than react, you can gain so much more from a situation. And this this sounds like a brilliant example of that. Yeah, I think it's really interesting, uh, listeners, for those of you who are considering maybe having less real estate or, or if you're a small business or a new business thinking, okay, will I need an office at some point? But I think yeah. the question of what will the office be for? Yes, is what crucial. do we want from it? Um, yeah. yeah, and they, they are always really worth listening to the base camp people they put out a lot of great content they're one of these organizations that work really transparently and share a lot of their thinking and their processes as well as their results um also i think i sure saw a tweet from jason free earlier this week about their book remote is either offering it free or you can get a refund if you send in your receipt or something they're they're trying to give that book away at the moment Wow, excellent. So we're not doing that with ours. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, we're, we're a little bit smaller that's, than that's base. That's how camp. much we're making. <laughs> yeah. We I will try and find a link costs. to that tweet, though, but um, because obviously they've sold a lot more copies than we have. It's, it's still a very good uh, sort of basic how to book. So if you're, if you're really thinking, oh, no, how am I going to do this? Then. Um, yeah. you read that as well as thinking remote. Yes, of course. <laughs> so going back to the title, which was "You Never Forget George Papa George," uh, he was he's the uh, the lease the the guy who holds the lease. He's an architect, oh, George okay. Papa George. <laughs> so anyway, so that that was that. So that was a really uh, lovely one. Uh, so it's from the Rework podcast, and it's episode sixty eight. Let's go back to Trello and up okay um let's show we uh, this this is a little bit um these two are a little bit linked so the last two so there's one if i can go first to uh 
another uh, Eva was very uh, was very <laughs> active on Twitter and LinkedIn for the last uh, few weeks, but she did share. So this is um, a publication by the European Union. And it's on mental health of workers in the digital era. So, of course, it's not just remote work. I mean, this is the amazing context that we live in, is that whether you're co-located or working online all the time, there's a lot of crossover. And uh, co-located uh, workers also work a lot digitally. So um, it's called, so I'll, I'll quote, it's uh, The Mental Health of Workers in the Digital Era with the subtitle How Recent Technical Innovation and Its Pace Affects the Mental Well-Being of Workers. So, Maya, I thought if I just uh, read out the key findings. And yes, then we so this is a, a meaty bit of, bit of research, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's really good. So it's, it's a big, uh, so, so now that you mentioned that, it's a big piece of meta. It's, I think it's mm. a meta-analysis yes. uh, of... 5,600 papers. Uh, no, number of papers selected based screening. There can't yeah, be that I'm, many papers. On no, no, no. Work. Sorry. No, no, no. Sorry. I've got it wrong. You see, this is what happens. When, uh, you have to listen out for these things, listeners, when people are saying things and you go, hang on. We're testing uh, you. So, no. <laughs> the number of papers identified as a result of searching the literature databases uh, was mm. 5,600. The okay. number of papers selected based on the screening of title 166 the number of papers selected for full text screening was 39 and the number of papers included in the briefing was 22. Okay. Right. So Even that's, that's, that's still it. huge, isn't it? Yeah. Just yeah. 22 so papers. <laughs> yeah. So um, this is all about the effect of technology on how we work. So I'm just going to quote directly from the paper, which is actually, if you follow the link in the show notes, you can read the whole thing. So key findings. New ways of working can have an undesirable influence on both workload and stress. Hyperconnectivity has added a new dimension to techno stress by prolonging its effects through time with detrimental consequences to society and individuals. Intrusive technology characteristics, such as their accessibility outside the conventional workplace, open brackets and work times, close brackets, are dominant predictors of anxiety, isolation and sleep deprivation. Older individuals seem to be influenced more by techno stress while younger individuals are more vulnerable to overload. Males and females present some differences on their relation to technology, with the latter, the females, more susceptible to techno-stress. Continuous demands for technological adaptation can be psychologically detrimental. Working with technology increases the probability of burnout. Working with technology can negatively impact the quality of life. Working with technology can provoke techno -addic addiction, and I'm laughing because I'm so addicted to my phone right now. And finally, the above mentioned adverse effects do not depend on the technology itself, but on the way it is used. Yes, that's the thing that matters, <laughs> and that kind of not undermines all those other conclusions, but makes me want to question them and say, yes, but, yes, but. Surely it depends. Well, they're not saying there's no benefits <laughs> no, to it. I know. They're saying these are the effect the effects on the mental uh, on the mental well being of workers. So yeah. this is what they found. Um mm. they obviously didn't look at all the um maybe they didn't look at the positive effects. <laughs> I suppose what I mean is compared to what, you know, who doesn't work with technology, uh, there's no, gonna be no control group for these workers that they studied for doing the job with medieval ag agricultural tools or something by comparison you know the technology is a part of our lives and the stress and or the negativity that they found are things that we have to find better ways to manage but the tools themselves are surely neutral it's really got to be about how they're deployed oh yeah no they're not saying that the tools are bad mm. they're saying that uh, new ways of working can have an undesirable influence on both yeah. workload and stress uh, yeah i i can't find anything to criticize about this. Uh, it's just that it does paint a very bleak picture. Um, and I completely agree uh, that I've seen, I mean, I've seen this. Uh, it's, um, yeah, who was I talking about with uh, Caitlin McDonald the other day? She was also saying, well, sometimes there's stress that comes from a lot of information, stress, and some people hide away because they can't cope with all that information. And then some people find stress in the fact that they don't have enough information. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's um, it's it's so broad. It is. Um, it's really interesting. And one of the things that I remember from your conversation with Caitlin McDonald was she said so much of how you feel about it depends on your motivation 
yeah. and how you're primed to respond to that. You know, if the tech is enabling you to do something you really want to do and it helps you get in flow and it helps you work in an office optional way or whatever, then the, the tech is wonderful. But if you feel like it's stalking you and intruding into your personal time or your headspace or your mental well-being, then of course that's intrusive and it so much depends on the frame in which you engage in it. Yeah. And I think this is something to remember. I'm going to go back to the, the, the whole coronavirus conversation also. If we, um, when we learn to work independently from others, uh, most of us, most of us who've been in the online space for long, we learn to set uh, boundaries mm. and we learn to respect others' boundaries. I have a feeling when we are working in the co-located space, a lot of those boundaries are set up by the building. When I'm in the building, I'm doing this. When I'm home, I'm doing that. Mm -hmm. When suddenly people moving, especially to work from home, I'm not even talking about remote work, just working from home, those boundaries, you need to learn to manage them differently. You need to learn that actually your work is now super accessible at home. Mm -hmm. uh, people need to understand that just because you're working at home and you have your laptop next to you, it doesn't mean that you should be opening it or, or that, that you need to be opening it. Um, and so this, all of this just, um, yeah. It, Completely agree. To, it's, yeah, it's, hmm. you've got to be so much more self-reliant when you don't have those things set for you externally. And it's not even just about the building. It's about the flow of the day. And people normally mm. arrive at this yeah. time and they normally take a break at this time or and they go home at this time. And all of that's kind of dictated for you. Um, and when you're suddenly on your own with that, you can either replicate that or you could try and find your own pattern and pathway through it, which ultimately might be the most productive and good thing to do for you. But it, it doesn't just happen and people have to be a bit conscious about this. Yeah. And um, in the, the, the bit or one of the bits that I hadn't thought of as much is the intrusive technology characteristics, such as their accessibility outside the conventional workplace and work times, are dominant predictors of anxiety, isolation and sleep deprivation. I found that really interesting. I haven't uh, uh, looked through the paper enough to understand the link with with isolation, but um, it it's you really don't know, like sometimes just having being hyper connected can actually have the opposite effect to feeling connected um and i i think so that's another thing that we need to remember is to 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 like you were saying actually maya to learn how to get the technology to work for us mm. and not to be um uh, addicted to it and to be uh kidnapped by it almost yeah or I don't know. Is there a danger in some situations that we let the technology replace that kind of control over us that the workplace offered? Maybe if we're going to work more independently, we don't have those structures around us by the working day and the rhythms it creates and the pattern of activities. Maybe we're delegating that to our phones, but then they're following us into our evenings and we can't get that balance right because of that. So, yeah, you're right. It's absolutely about the individual owning it and controlling it and deciding what they want from it. Yeah. So thank you, uh, Eva, for this. Uh, again, it's called The Mental Health of Workers in the Digital Era. And I think for, for us in the space who say technology has made our life so much better, <laughs> also, it's really good to uh, be faced with stuff like this. To want to remind us that it does have a dark side. We know it, but we, we want to forget. And also for anyone listening, just to remember that even if it's individuals, we're not having that problem. There might be people who have, uh, and it's such a individual thing. So thank you, Eva, for that. Um, I think let's go. Let's go to our. It's, it's kind of. It's not in the same vein, but it's it's also about health, Maya, and it's uh, it's uh, this article that uh, that you shared at some point with me, and it's it's great. So I'm going to um, read the title, which is called "Workplace Culture Must Change to Support Women's Health." Must change is in inverted commas. Not sure why, um, and it is actually from 11th of February 2020 in the Telegraph. Yeah, we, we don't usually quote stuff from the Telegraph. No, we don't. They're obviously <laughs> quoting somebody else who dared to say that workplace culture must change to accommodate women. Um, but it, it is interesting. Um, and this this caught my eye, obviously, because it's, it's talking about the way that work itself needs to change, never mind where we're doing it from. It's recognising that everything that women bring to the workplace, but the fact that that means that there are, thankfully, now many more women in more senior positions um, with 
rich careers in many different sectors. Indeed, women are legally now being forced to work a lot longer and later in life than they may originally have chosen to do. But that can mean great changes in women's health, in their bodies, in their hormones, and the workplace needs to account for that. I think it's an ongoing manifestation of this whole concept that the world is built around men as the norm. And Cristina Criado Perez's book about how everything from sort of safety equipment to spacesuits are built for men as the default and women are different and things aren't necessarily adapted to take account of that. And just remembering that women are hormonal and cyclical in different ways and that that can enrich your workplace and your culture, but it doesn't, it's not invisible. It needs to be taken account of. So um, I think some of the things in this article it, it really depends how much of an issue it is in different workplaces, whether you need to have a menopause champion in your HR department. It might be overkill depending on the size of your organisation, but it might be absolutely critical and it might really shift the conversation and enable some people in your workforce to be much happier and more contented and healthy and well and actually able to stay and contribute actively in the workforce perhaps for longer. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so this the article is all about that from periods to menopause, millions of women in the UK say their work life is affected by female health related issues. So what more can businesses do to support them? And it is true that this influence, because it's hormones, because it's hormones, it's emotions, <laughs> because it's emotions, it affects relationships uh, and it goes beyond that. I mean, you really do need to to read the article. Um, there's a couple of things that I really liked. And one is the they mentioned at one point that uh, they were that there were some men only kind of trainings to understand mm. this and I thought that that that's it because you can't always be uh, you, you really have to educate both sexes about everything uh, and uh, and I like that to create a safe space for uh, men who are I mean I don't think they experience anything like this anything like no, the and they might be really curious yeah. and, but are scared of asking the wrong questions yeah. or whatever I think it's great and it is a bit of a mystery. And if it's one of those things that's not talked about, it might not have been talked about in their childhood home or, you know, they might not ever have experienced in their personal lives these conversations. So they need to happen in the workplace. A generation ago, women were scared to talk about their children in the workplace and, and the impact that they had on their lives. I think that conversation has hopefully moved on in a lot of cases, not everywhere. And maybe the next stage is that we can move on to talking about our cycles and our our hormones and our menopause in the same open way. But we do need that education first. And this is completely in line with everything we talk about in this show. Uh, and I'll, I'll I'll read some stuff about workplace action. So basically what has happened in some workplaces. Uh, so, for example, uh, flexible working and adjustment to shift patterns are general strategies, as well as access to cold drinks and good ventilation. Um, and then this goes back to your point about the, the astronaut suits, which is really wonderful. I'm going to quote, for example, in 2017, not Nottinghamshire police introduced a menopause policy and issued guidance to managers saying they could consider requests from women who needed to adjust their uniform to accommodate short-term weight gain and bloating or their working hours. Because it could be just something like that. Like if your body is also changing, mm. go, it's, it, it, is, it is something that affects you. And also even to the thing that, you know, you might need different kind of uniforms for a time. <laughs> yeah, if you're uncomfortable physically. And it, it can be temporary. You know, I think for women, maybe one of the things that's harder for men whose bodies are less cyclical to grasp is that some of these things come and go and, it would be awful for a woman to leave a job that she loves and a career that she's advanced in and making a great contribution in because for a few years she's absolutely miserable through the menopause because her uniform doesn't fit anymore or the office is too hot. Um, she's got zero flexibility and can't rest when she needs to or whatever. And, you know, she could have many more years to make a contribution in that role afterwards. It's really very much in the organisation's interests as well to get on board with this and make the necessary changes. And of course, if we're working in a remote team, we might not be seeing a lot of this. Yeah. And this might be happening uh, without anyone else noticing and it could be affecting a team member and nobody else knows unless we, we, we find the space to talk about it, unless we create the space uh, to talk about it. It's not like, okay, we're going to talk about monopause. <laughs> monopause. <laughs> 
<laughs> we're going to talk about the menopause, but it could be, I mean, we'll talk later about visible teamwork. It could be really creating space and just uh, getting used to a habit of just communicating a little bit more about our, um, our individual context. Yeah, just having a psychologically safe space where people can genuinely ask, how are you doing today? And people can answer that with confidence and integrity to even if it means saying do you know what I'm, I'm having a really really terrible day because um, I've been really ill with this situation all night and and being feeling that it's completely okay and in fact absolutely the right thing to do to share that excellent well that's what's going on in the wider world of work now let's see what's happening on ha what's happening with virtual not distant Podcast is a place where listeners can connect. Get in touch via virtualnotdistant.com. Right, well, lots going on, Maya. <laughs> I think we should start with listener feedback because, uh, well, it always opens up the conversation. So let's um, let's start with uh, uh, the episode on online communities. I think it was uh, 200, uh, no, it wasn't 222. Um, online communities where we featured hoxby.com and somebody, Kat Lewis Shand, she passed, uh, she stopped by the show notes and she dropped a comment which we don't usually get so that was really nice and she said um, joining uh, she said I wanted to tell you what it's like to be a Hawksby as in someone who's joined Hawksby.com she said joining Hawk <laughs> so let's, let's do that again joining Hawksby has for me been a life-changing decision is that a bit of an exaggeration not at all I've been out of work for over five years due to a debilitating and incurable condition called occipital neuralgia also known as ice pick headaches. I had to leave my last job on medical grounds and found it very difficult to come to terms with the fact that I may never be able to return to work in the traditional sense. The more time I spent at home on my own, the more my already deepening depression set in. I felt unable to contribute to my family fin financially and it soon became apparent that questions such as what have you been up to today could be answered with one word nothing. Lack of self-worth led to a reluctance to socialize and therefore my business network also dwindled away to virtually nothing. Hawksby doesn't just bring people together as a formidable workforce, it has built a solid base of friends, teammates and an amazing network of talent from all over the world. Wow, that's so I mean, powerful. When you uh, release a podcast about something and then someone f who is part of that community comes into your blog and leaves a comment like that, <laughs> you are doing something well. Congratulations, uh, Hoxby.com. Yeah, I mean, it was even from listening to that episode and that interview and working on the show notes, it was clear that there was something very strongly identifying around them as a community that was very powerful. But you spoke to the leader of it who had a particular perspective on it. Um, And it, it's somehow it's even more powerful to hear it from somebody who's a member of it and really giving this amazing testimony about how it's been absolutely life-changing for her. Um, and it was really generous of her to share those details about her health and uh, mental health and the change that, that being part of something online and being able to get back into the workforce and have a, a meaningful way of participating um, has meant to her. So thanks so much for sharing that, Kat Lewis Shand. Yeah, so Alex Hurst uh, from Hoxby.com is featured in episode 222 on online communities. So we've got uh, another <laughs> another comment on also that same, I know it's the episode on uh, onboarding and it was from Simon on our LinkedIn page. So we do have a LinkedIn page. It's a little bit quiet, but you know, Maya posts there. <laughs> and um, Simon was saying, uh, following the onboarding episode, he said, I certainly second the idea that integration of new team members starts well before what's normally called the onboarding process and that integration is a more helpful term for the process. And this was all about Mark Kilby saying he prefers integration to onboarding. I think I'd go yet further than Mark Kilby appears to in the podcast by proposing that integration starts even before the interview. 
the way the company presents itself to candidates, its website, blog posts, social media, etc., sets the scene for potential recruits' interactions with the company and even causes some self-selection of those that are attracted or put off by what they perceive of the company through its communications. By the way, thanks for the great podcast. <laughs> Had to put that, had to Any read time. that out also. <laughs> Any time. Thank you, Simon. <laughs> uh, so, Simon, thank you very, very much um, for that. And that was, it's not episode 222, it's episode 219, which was our first 2019 episode on onboarding. Yeah, uh, that feels like a long time ago with everything that's happened this year. But no, it's a really important point, actually, because we, we often talk about in recruitment about candidates, you know, you will be Googled, people will form an impression of you before they meet you, they will research you and so on. And this is pointing out that that works both ways and the candidates will form an impression of an organisation from everything that they're putting out there, good or bad. Yeah, excellent. And then there's one comment from um, uh, that came through from an article that you wrote quite some time ago, Maya, about exploding remote stereotypes. And this was Carly Goka who uh, commented and said, wonderful post, Maya. And then she quoted, can we start to intelligently embrace what remote and flexible working really mean and the potential they offer to both individuals and enterprises? I couldn't agree more. Well said. So <laughs> thank you, Carly. And, well, and congratulations, Maya. Isn't that funny? That one's, I think, is about two years old, that article. But I think in the context of what we were saying earlier about a lot of people discovering remote work and talking about it for the first time, these things bubble up again. Yeah. So um, that's uh, most of the feedback that we've had uh, recently. And uh, just uh, to remind you listeners that at the moment we have a connection and disconnection series going on brought to uh, us in collaboration by Shield Geo. And uh, we'd love to hear if you're listening to that series what you think of it. And I think it might be quite, well, I think it's a good, it's timely also, mm. this connection and this connection in view of what's going on. Yes, how prescient it was to be putting this out, just like your book on meetings, Villa. All these oh, things yes. <laughs> come together for a reason somehow. <laughs> listeners, listeners, online meetings that matter is out. It's a guide for managers of remote teams. It's not a facilitator's guide, <laughs> but it is for managers of remote teams. So it does have that context of you're working in a team. It's not for one-off meetings. And um, Maya did a lovely uh, article review on it. I didn't. I didn't ask her to really. <laughs> she said, well, you can't she, ask for reviews. You know, they no. have to be a bit spontaneous. So. Yes, yes. So <laughs> thank you, Maya. I thank you publicly. Um, listeners, you, the paperback will be out at some point. We're just having some delays with that. And you know what? I'm also going to thank my mother. I know this is a bit weird, but my mother has read the whole book and she's she's almost studied it and it's amazing that she's done that so i i think Aww. so i think the book is okay and you know it's not ah uh, her mother no my mother is no, no, also no. critical. <laughs> I've so, met Pilar's mum. She yes. will say what she thinks. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> so, so that, yeah, so we've got that. We've got all that. And then um, I'm actually, uh, I, I, again, I'm falling, I'm behind this, but I'm involved in this platform network it's it's maybe movement um called next stage radicals and for now because i because i'm behind with what i want to be contributing to it just head over to nextstageradicals.net and check it out because that's an interesting uh, platform it's all about new ways of working evolving the workplace and it's there's a whole mixture of people from the um you know from the self management organizational development remote social stuff it's 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 a mega mix of of people that are being nicely brought together by uh, Andy Andy Brogan lovely thank you Andy for for doing that Right, so we've got not very long to go over visible teamwork, uh, but we, um, yes, let's, let's go into the final bit of today's episode. So just to give this episode a little bit of a, I don't know, content focus, <laughs> because these episodes, they're, they're great, but they can, as we see, go uh, uh, all over the place. But we thought we'd uh, bring back a lot of what we've been talking about into this concept of visible teamwork. And this is what, I suppose it's something that is very different, a very different approach to managing teams that are remote versus co-located. Because as we've seen through this episode, uh, co-located teams also use technology a lot. Maya mentioned Microsoft Teams. That is being used in a lot of um, organizations with people who work in the office. 
so it's a real thinking, okay, what are the things that we need to be doing in a remote team or when we have, when we're doing online collaboration that we might not need to, to do in the co-located space. So this aspect of visible teamwork is all about that, is getting the different things that teamwork is made up of. And that's a very interesting conversation to start having. It's okay, what do we mean by teamwork? Uh, and then how do we make a lot of that visible when, when we're apart from each other for most of the time, we don't see it. So we've got uh, three, there's three sections to visible teamwork. It's the uh, deliberate communication, visible work, and planned spontaneity. We do have a whole episode on planned spontaneity. So if that, uh, if that piques your interest, then to episode 211, it's a few months old, that's all about planned spontaneity. But I suppose deliberate communication, Maya, actually you wrote a whole blog post on one of the aspects yes. of deliberate <laughs> communication. <laughs> yeah, and we'll be writing more about all of this, I'm sure, to cover the other aspects. The, the aspect that I wrote about most recently was about communicating how we are and giving off signals about our mood and what's going on for us, the kind of things that we don't have to be deliberate about in the normal workspace, because if it if it's that apparent, people pick it up and notice it about you. Whereas in the remote space, just as we were talking about people going through menopausal symptoms or whatever, it, it simply might not be obvious to everybody else. Yes, so there's three aspects to deliberate communication. One is mood, as Maya was saying. The other one is context, what's going on at your end. And the other one is availability. And the availability is specifically important to teams with flexible schedules. If you have a nine to five approach, then probably availability, well, you're supposed to be available during those yeah, times. But you might not be available to necessarily drop what you're doing and have a chat, or you might prefer to have your head down in that piece of deep work or that podcast recording or whatever else. So even if you're logged on simultaneously, you can signal your availability to your co-workers as to whether you're available for that tap on the shoulder or not. Yeah. So there's all of that. It's it's really, I suppose, the, the way to implement something like the concept of deliberate communication would be to think, okay, what are all the different types of things we pick up from each other when we are seeing each other? And then, okay, well, how are we going to make sure that if we want to, we can communicate those. Because that, of course, is, is, is really important, is that if this is going to help us, we do it. If not, you don't. <laughs> yeah. And is anybody going to be left thinking, I don't know what my colleague's doing, or I don't know where they are, or I don't know how they are. I don't know whether it's okay for me to talk to them right now, or if I can pick up the phone or, or whatever. So it's about plugging all those little gaps that can maybe leak out of the communication bucket when you can't see people or just observe what they're doing or how they're appearing or their body language. Yeah. So we've got that deliberate communication. Then there's the concept of work visibility, which you need to be set up for. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is where technology comes in really, really handy, although you can also do it in other ways. So just like deliberate communication has mood, context, availability, work visibility has also three things in, in, in it. One is conversations in the open. The other is workflow visibility. And then the third one is, I don't have it here. <laughs> <laughs> I've forgotten uh, uh, the work, the work yes. visibility. Yeah, you've got workflow visibility and you've got work visibility. Again, these are things that need to be discussed and set up and some teams will need them more than others. The first concept, conversations in the open, it's all about having, when you're having a written conversation of having it where other team members can see it, unless they need to be private. Remember, you can't, <laughs> this is not about having to have every single conversation in the open. It's about choosing the conversations that might be of interest to other people and having them in the open. And this is best done through things like Microsoft Teams and Slack, as we know. It's also overlapping, isn't it? Because that's this kind of aspect of deliberate conversation, as deliberate communication as well, which things do, would it help to just have visible to everybody and which things might need to stay private for sort of legal or financials or whatever. But that's something that's worth discussing also in, yeah. in thinking of adopting this is when when shall we? Or, or maybe 
I don't know. Do you always need to discuss everything? I don't know anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I think this aspect of the trilogy of visible teamwork, uh, the idea of making the work visible is probably the thing that's going to be most unique to each organization. And even with each team or with each role within each organization, because it's going to come down so granularly to what you do, what tools you need to do it, who needs to see you doing it, who's affected by it, who depends on you to do a thing so they can do a thing and so on. So how you choose to design design those processes to make things visible or not um, and make them available to people, make sure that the right people get the right message at the right time. That's going to be incredibly unique. What we're saying is you need to do that deliberately. You need to think about it and plan it. And that's also where the team agreement can come into effect. Mm. Um, and to be honest, I've heard, I have had th um, comments like when we're trying to do a team agreement, oh, but it's just common sense. No, it's not. No, uh, no. It's, it's, you need to it's agree. It's huge. Yeah, and actually this is the area where all the people rushing to say everybody work from home then are going to fall flat on their faces possibly because this stuff doesn't just happen and it really does take if, – if you're used to it happening because you're all in the same room, then yes, it is common sense. But as soon as you're not all in the same room and seeing what each other are doing, then it has to become so much more intentional and specific. Yeah. So we've got open conversations, which which also you don't even need to have like Slack or Microsoft Teams. It's also about remembering what kind of conversations you have with one person that somebody else might have benefited from overhearing or that you would have benefited from someone else overhearing. So if you're only having, for example, uh, audio check-ins in the morning and then you're not contacting each other for the rest of the day because you're a mobile team, then, um, well, what are those conversations that you need to bring back to the table that people might want to? So again, the thing with visible teamwork is that there are concepts that regardless of how you work, you can look at adapting. Then visible workflow, which is about uh, tasks, progress of tasks. Uh, and again, you know, you can do, do it in any way you want. Uh, Excel, Trello, Planner, if you want to have status meetings. Go yeah. ahead. <laughs> well, you might need a huge project management app if you're doing lots of very yes. interrelated things with other people that are contingent on sort of different different critical paths. Or even if you're all working on the same thing but different bits of it, and mm. you you know you need to make that visible when people want it. So, yeah, it's it, again, it's going to be incredibly unique to what you do and how you do it. What we want you to do is have the conversation about it and set something up that works for you. And I was talking to someone the other day who I'm going to be working with and they were saying, yeah, our, our managers, the, this whole issue of accountability and always having to make team members accountable is proving difficult at a distance. And uh, I said, okay, well, you've got teams. They said, yeah, we, we meet in teams. Okay. <laughs> teams is not just a video meeting app, but yeah, okay, good. You're using that. Did you know that you have something like Planner called Planner Inside? What? Okay. You have a look, talk to your IT, see whether you have this tool called Planner. What you can do there is everyone can put up the tasks they're doing and their progress. And you know what? Suddenly everyone's accountable to everyone else and not yeah. just to the manager. <laughs> just like, what? <laughs> and and everybody can point. see where the bottlenecks are, where yeah. the lack productivity or otherwise is showing up, yeah. whether there are problems with an area of the work and so on. And as soon as it's, it's visible, then everyone can share responsibility for it. It's brilliant. And this is, this is where the online space can, I mean, when we first got into the online space, it's about the fact that you can self-organize and, and managers should be trying to get teams to self-organize because then we can think about higher level stuff and we can look at advocacy and development and coaching and training. Um, and if we're just doing, if you're just making sure that everyone is doing the work well that's not the best use of our time no that's so the very some, most boring aspect of management yeah, surely if you, can, yes. if you can get out of everybody's way and let them do that themselves then it's the easiest though Maya. oh it's yes i know and a lot of yeah. people um make a career at that level <laughs> quite happily yes. pushing things around her. but it's it's not where the greatest motivation and fulfillment lies for a lot of people yeah. So we've got visible workflow. And then if you can, and again, this really, it will depend a lot on the, the security aspects of the work, the confidentiality of what you work on and how you set up. But having visible work also helps for all the reasons that we're saying, because everyone can see. Although there are problems sometimes, uh, Luis from the Distant Job post podcast said to me, but if everyone can see what I'm doing, then they can give me unwanted feedback. <laughs> so, well, that's where the team agreement, uh, team charter comes in. Um, so there's also... Ooh. 
<laughs> Sorry, listeners, that's a big box of screws that fell. You should see my podcast setup. Um, so that is also about the visible work, um, being able just, and it, I find it great to see what people are working on. It's really interesting. I mean, it can be bad for your own productivity if there's far too many interesting yes. things going on when you do your own work. If everybody else, this is fascinating to watch. But <laughs> Yeah. So that again, and that's another conversation. And But you see all of these also, apart from the, the information that open conversations, visible workflow and visible work can bring, they can also be a point of connection for someone like me. And I don't know about you, but I think you're also quite curious, <laughs> Maya. Um, and, and it's you, when you're away from people uh, just seeing what they're doing or reading what they're saying might actually or or listening to some conversation uh, in audio can it can remind you who you're working with and what they're doing and how your work is connected to them yeah and why you're doing it in the first place you know why you're you're part of that team with those people it just you know all the the whole piece around loneliness and isolation it's a way of of just reconnecting with with everybody else's stuff yeah. So the final bit is planned spontaneity. And I'm just going to name the three things and then I'm going to refer you to the episode where Maya and I talked about this in more detail. Again, another three, because we have three in, we have three in each of the three. Three and three. That's <laughs> weirdly nice. symmetrical. Yes. <laughs> yes. It's, and we even have a nice banner, uh, a, a nice image that you can use. Uh, uh, like, uh, yeah, anyway, uh, I'm not going to go there. So virtual coffees. One thing, meeting in the work, which needs technology where you can see where people are if they're online at the same time as you, how what they're working on right there and then. And then finally, we go all the way back to availability again, because you cannot be spontaneous when you are worried, as Maya was saying, about the fact that you might be disturbing someone. So again, having that availability of, you know, I'm, I'm working on this, but actually if anyone needs me, I'm free to chat. I'm free to just have a little break with you. Uh, is also very um, signals to people that they can be spontaneous about how they interact with you. Mm. Okay, yeah. <laughs> good. So I, I gather, I gather we're done. <laughs> well, we did cover that one in a lot of detail. Yes, we'll put yes. a link in to that episode because it is really important that it's, it's one of the most it's probably the most intangible of the trilogy to try and explain to people. Clan spontaneity has an inherent contradiction in, in the very phrase, but actually it's really important and I hope people will listen to the other episode. And in fact, two episodes ago when I was talking to Caitlin, that was the first thing she mentioned was how people who are co-located re are really aware of those spontaneous interactions, but mm. there is no awareness that they can be recreated in the online space. Yes. And that's probably what they miss most. The people who are suddenly being sent home away from their colleagues right now are probably really missing those little coffees and chats and the water cooler and everything else. Yeah. So listeners, we have a couple of articles on our blog, which cover virtual team, uh, virtual, te virtual teamwork, no visible teamwork in a very loose way. We've got one that is, uh, shows the link to motivation as designed, as uh, defined by self-determination theory. It's not scientific. It's just, we're, I'm just linking stuff to it. <laughs> I mm. haven't, haven't done any research like the one that Eva uh, forwarded to us, but I hope that you can see also how a lot of what we're being in talking about all the things that are coming up in articles, etc., can uh, actually can be related to this concept of visible teamwork, like deliberate communication for when when we're not feeling well or opening up conversations that we need to be addressing uh, in a, in our workplace, or the planned spontaneity to to recreate that feeling of of, um, of even mystery and joy, you know, that happens when you bump yeah. into into someone else uh, to address connection. So there's lots, there's lots of little things there. So this takes us to almost an hour. Hey, we're back to over the hour, Maya. Oh, I hope, <laughs> hope you're all still listening. <laughs> Wake um, up we, at the back. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're still listening, you might really like working with us. So I'm going to plug our services to you. So we do do training on visible teamwork. And also we would love to, um, we would love to talk to you if you're transitioning to being a remote team. Even if you're not going to get our services, we're always on the lookout for real life experience 
samples because mm. this is all great in theory, but we really learn from what people are doing. And that's how we develop our thinking also. Because all of this comes from reading lots of stuff that people are doing and really thinking and if finally just finding a way of framing what other people are doing. So we've got that. We've also got coaching for uh, managers of remote teams and we are starting more facilitation for teams that are in the beginning conversations of transitioning to remote. For a while, many of these will be virtual, <laughs> we know, but also co-located. So listeners, get in touch, virtualnotdistant.com. You can email Pilar at virtualnotdistant.com. Follow us, Virtual Teamwork, on Twitter with an O instead of a zero. Maya, do you want to say goodbye to listeners? Yeah, it's a zero instead of an O, but um, oh. <laughs> everybody knew what you meant. Yeah. <laughs> And yes, we'd love to catch up with you in our virtual space. Thanks for listening so far. Bye for now. A big thank you for listening to the 21st Century Work Life podcast produced by Virtual Not Distant. If you have something to add to the conversation, let us know through the contact form over at virtualnotdistant.com. I have been your host, Pilar Orti, and I'm signing off now. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, enjoy. Enjoy.